it. Welcome to the Optimistic Curmudgeon, where the best ideas win. I'm your host, Josh Heron. Today, I'm joined by Carissa Mulder. Carissa is a co-author of a new book entitled A Dubious Expediency, How Race Preferences Damage Higher Education. She holds a Juris Doctorate from the University of Notre Dame, and she is the Special Assistant to Commissioner Peter Kersenow of the U.S. Commissioner on Civil Rights. I'm sorry, that's the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. Carissa, welcome to the Optimistic Curmudgeon. Thanks, Josh. I'm really happy to be here today. And just as a disclaimer, before we get started, I'm appearing only in my personal capacity and not on behalf of the commission. Excellent. Well, I am really excited to talk with you and uh, just maybe to kind of set the stage for our conversation. As I was looking through your book earlier today, it reminded me of a, a time a couple years ago and I was kind of dreaming about maybe going into uh, uh, into the, the academic rat race and try to become a professor. And I was looking through the application for a major university in California that had a job posting. And I thought, you know, maybe I'm competitive. This is interesting. The PhD program I'm in sounds like it'd be a good fit until I hit the requirement of a diversity statement. Uh, the job posting I was looking at had nothing to do with increasing tolerance or diversity. Uh, it was a great books-based program that seemed to be all about reading books together with people and talking about them and uh, having the right qualifications to do that. But here is this diversity statement in the middle of the application. You had to sign the statement and then explain how your research was going to advance the, the, the needs of diversity in the academy. Now, but I, I had to infer from the context, it's not talking about intellectual diversity, like different theories or anything like that. This is referring to ethnic and racial diversity. And it seems to me that that is a huge fixation of the academy today. And then when I saw uh, your book and particularly your chapter in the book, I was struck by just how much that seems to not just be coming from the top down as far as like hiring and what are what are uh, HR departments looking for in hiring, but also from the bottom up in admissions and really just looking at the way a focus on diversity comes into uh, the university from the from each incoming class. So with all that as a, kind of a preface, Carissa, tell us a bit about the book. How did this book come about? What's the major question? Uh, what, what are your thoughts on this book? Yes, um, absolutely. So the editors of this book are Gail Harriet and Maimon Schwartzchild. They are both professors at the University of San Diego Law School. Uh, Gail is also a commissioner at the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights with my boss, Peter Kersenow. And the idea behind this book was to bring together essays from a lot of leading thinkers who have considered the ideas around racial preferences in higher education from a number of perspectives, had different experiences. So for example, the first essay in the book is by John Ellis, who is a former Dean at UC Santa Cruz. And he was there in the seventies when affirmative action really started getting underway. And he talks about how it started, the impetus behind it, how it grew and how he eventually came to see it as very harmful to the university, to the supposed beneficiaries, but also how it took on a life of its own and became very difficult to undo. So that's one thing. Um, another chapter that I think would really go to what you're talking about is Peter Wood's essay about diversity, where he talks about the tensions inherent in the idea and in how it uh, plays out in academia in particular. But I think that you are, you're really onto something there where you, when you mention that diversity isn't an idea that's just coming from the top down. It's also coming from the bottom up. And that's something that Gail and I discuss in our essay when we talk about one of the reasons that universities um, try to do more and more in terms of diversity is because there's student agitation for it. Um, so it's a way of um, trying to uh, mollify angry students. Uh, it's a way to um, keep alumni happy. It's a way to keep accreditors happy. And so the pressure to embrace this idea is coming from all sides at this point. 
That is really interesting. I think in part, it, it takes me back to at least what I've heard stories from 1968 and student riots that really inaugurated a new era in colleges and universities where students had much more say in the running of the university. But it seems like then, in that case, the people who know the least about the way a university runs or ought to run are the ones who are sort of running the show. Is that is that right? If students are the ones really agitating for this? That's correct. And additionally, you're right to pinpoint 1968 because that was a year when a lot changed in regard to affirmative action and uh, also at universities. Um, because of the student riots and there were also you know race riots in washington dc and in other major cities um, a lot of the institutions panicked and they weren't sure what to do in order to try to calm things down and so one of the ideas that they hit upon was we've just got to do something and this is when affirmative action really started getting going as a way of doing something and i think that a corollary of that was at the same time, you of course have the counterculture, you have the embrace of the youth movement. And so there was sort of a sense of youth taking the lead, you know, they're the ones teaching us that sort of idea. And to a certain extent, that ethos has continued until today. Um, but that is when it gets started. It goes back much farther than a lot of people realize. And that's really interesting because I would not have thought that the things we see today are as old as 53 years. I mean, I would, so I, I think uh, I first ran into this uh, from the position of being a teacher who was trying to help students get into college when I had, mm -hmm. a, uh, I had an Indian student who insisted that uh, there was racial discrimination against him and his application to Yale. I thought that was the silliest thing I'd ever heard. I thought, no, no, come on now. If anything, there's a there's a preference for anyone with a minority card. And Asian Americans are not the majority culture in the United States currently in 2021. So I thought, oh, this student has a minority card. Well, uh, he came in the next day with the Wall Street Journal article about the, the story at Yale. And uh, I forget which group kind of audited their admissions, but found a clear preference uh, for any other races over Asian Americans or Asian applicants, uh, seeming to hold Asian students to a much higher standard and much higher academic qualifications for admission. Uh, it just blew me away. Now, Carissa, I wonder if you could take us back through some of the, the case history here, because mm -hmm. I mean, when we're thinking about the 1960s, I'm thinking about the civil rights era and particularly uh, that that is, if I remember correctly, that's the era of the Civil Rights Act and the beginning of the language where now it's it's pretty universal. Everybody, no matter what they really do, every institution in America claims to not discriminate on the basis of age, sex, gender, religion, ethnicity, race, anything they could possibly discriminate against. So it seems like this ought to be very illegal. How how exactly do colleges and universities manage to hold on to this practice and, and really even be celebrated for holding on to a practice of including racial considerations in their admissions processes. Yes, so you're correct. The Civil Rights Act of 1964, specifically Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, prohibits racial discrimination by any institution that receives federal funding, which includes almost all colleges and universities. Um, obviously, Hillsdale is an outlier in that respect. Um, so that's 1964. Um, around this time, colleges and universities, of course, um, had had to desegregate the ones that were still segregated after Brown versus Board, and then you know the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Um, and so they started trying to recruit. At the time, it was mostly black students. There were, you know, the U.S. was majority white and black ethnic groups at that time. But, um, and Thomas Sowell talks about this in some of his writing because he was at Cornell when this was happening. They quickly found that there were not enough black students who were academically qualified for the Ivies. And a lot of this story starts with the Ivies. Um, so to simplify things, um, we'll just go with that. Um, so then there became this move to institute racial preferences. Of course, it starts as a soft preference, then 
you have to extend it a bit more. Um, and so this eventually was challenged in the 1970s by a white student who applied to the University of California, I believe it was UC Davis Medical School. His name was Alan Backey. He was white. He had served as a corpsman in the Vietnam War. He had worked at a hospital. He was not a person from a privileged background. I believe his father was a mailman. Um, and he had very good MCAT scores, very good grades. He applied to medical school and he just missed being admitted into the main group. But the medical school reserved 16 slots for underrepresented minorities. So, and, and it was like, these are our slots. So if Alan Backey had been a different color, um, and at the time, I think even if he had been Asian, he would have been admitted into one of those 16 slots, like right away. He was so dramatically overqualified compared to the people who were admitted to those 16 slots. So he sued in state court. And initially it went up to the California Supreme Court. The California Supreme Court said, no, University of California can't discriminate on the basis of race. This is illegal can't do this. Um, the regents of the University of California appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court and the Supreme Court deadlocked with almost deadlocked. It had four justices saying this is illegal, had another four saying, eh, this is, this is fine. You know, we need to give people a leg up, that sort of thing. Justice Lewis Powell was the one who eventually determined the decision. Uh, he wrote the controlling opinion and he was a conciliator and he basically was trying to have what he saw as the best of both worlds. And we will see this over and over and over again in cases at the Supreme Court that involve race in particular. So he hit on, well, the way the University of California did it was wrong because they reserved these particular, they reserved a set number of seats for people of particular races. But if they just wanted to ensure that they had a diverse student body, because you learn more if you have people of different cultures, different races, all that sort of thing in the same class, uh, better prepare you to go forth into the world, all this sort of thing. If they're just trying to do that and they don't have a hard number, then they can do it on the basis of diversity. So that is how the whole diversity idea got rolling. And ironically, this was just a, an afterthought in the brief that the University of California submitted. Um, this was not what they were basing their argument on. So, but with this as the rationale, colleges and universities were off to the races. But um, then the next big case, there were two of them, Graz and Gruder in 2003 involving the University of Michigan. And one was, for under, undergraduate admissions, the other was for law school admissions. So Gratz was suing in regard to racial preferences in undergraduate admissions. Gruder was in regard to law school admissions. The University of Michigan lost in regard to undergraduate admissions and they won in regard to law school admissions. And the difference again was that in undergraduate admissions, they had a point system where if you were a particular race, you got a big number of points added to your score to be admitted to the university. But the law school, it was just holistic review. We're just trying to get a diverse class, so on and so forth. Um, and Sandra Day O'Connor wrote the, the, uh, the opinion in Gruder and said, well, you know, this is fine for now. Hopefully in 25 years, this will no longer be necessary. And of course, at this point, we're coming up on the 25 years. The 25 years is 2028. Um, 
but you can again see this attempt to sort of finesse things from O'Connor uh, in Gruder. Then um, the next case was Fisher versus University of Texas, um, where uh, Abigail Fisher, a white student, sued over the University of Texas's use of racial preferences and admissions. Um, it went up to the Supreme Court first in, to, in 2013, and the Supreme Court sort of punted it back. And then it comes back again in 2016. And again, it nothing really happens. Um, basically, Gruder is still the controlling precedent. So that is why diversity is the rationale here, because the courts, the court has said we are willing to defer to colleges and universities in comprising their student body. And if they want to have a diverse student body, then that's their decision. But one of the things that's important to bear in mind is that diversity is not really the motivation here. And just as you noted with your Indian student, obviously Indian Americans are a racial minority in the United States, but you know, he still is at a disadvantage even compared to white students. Um, obviously, like ideological diversity is not something that the universities are really particularly interested in um, fostering. Um, sometimes, sometimes they do seek out geographic diversity that they will do sometimes, which is fair and I think makes sense. But really, um, the the motivation for diversity continues to be what it originally was back in the 1960s and 70s which is an attempt to rectify past racial wrongs or alternatively the newer version or the newer motivation is that all racial and ethnic groups should be represented in every field in the exact proportion that they occur in the population or else racism is the only possible explanation. Um, and I did, I pulled out the book here to, um, to uh, read a quote from a Harvard law professor that I think illustrates this point. Um, Harvard law professor Randall Kennedy, an affirmative action proponent, put it even more pointedly, quote, Let's be honest. Many who defend affirmative action for the sake of diversity are actually motivated by a concern that is considerably more compelling. They are not so much animated by a commitment to what is, after all, only a contingent pedagogical hypothesis. Rather, they are animated by a commitment to social justice. They would rightly defend affirmative action even if social science demonstrated uncontrovertibly that diversity or its absence has no effect or even a negative effect, effect on the learning environment. Oh my goodness, that is, I, I, I'm trying to figure out where to go from there, but that is such an interesting line is it seems that for, for those who hold to this uh, ideology, which I think that's the right word here, that it is in fact an ideology, it's a controlling narrative. They see the university as not as a place of higher learning, which is certainly how I would articulate if I was going to try and explain to a parent who was asking me, why should I sink $150,000 of real money or of borrowed money into yeah. my child's collegiate education, I would not start with because your child has the opportunity to participate in a four year social experiment where your child can be part of rectifying America's racially wrong past. Like, yes. if, if there's a justification for college, it's got to be in the fact that there's something unique about college that transforms the student through a community of learning and brings them into the life of the mind that is not as accessible in later parts of life. Mm -hmm. But that the, the very people whose careers are now part of forming those institutions, like the professor you just read, seem to have abandoned that. And they seem to have embraced instead the idea that the university exists to make of uh, in this case, the United States, a giant social laboratory. And we're going to use college admissions to try and create a uh, sort of utopic vision in a way. Yes. 
And I think that their vision is actually broader in that they see, they, they believe that every institution in society should be focused on rectifying these, these past wrongs and even wrongs that have nothing particularly to do with the United States. Um, if you are a, a child of recent immigrants, the U.S.'s past mistakes do not have all that much to do with you. <laughs> and, you know, um, but the university is where they have the most power and where they can very much say yay or nay to different people and set the curriculum and all that sort of thing. And even if you take a more utilitarian view of the university, for example, if you are primarily interested in STEM, for example, or even just as um, a signal for the job market for credentialing. Um, Heather McDonald talks in her essay about how STEM has been corrupted by affirmative action. And instead of, you know, fierce meritocracy, because, you know, you can definitely, there, there's a lot more room for interpretation and different perspectives and such in the humanities, as a humanities person myself. Um, when it comes to things like math and science, numbers are numbers to a certain extent. And, you know, they are, there's a lot of push not to get the best person now, particularly in faculty hiring, but also in STEM women, um, women and URM underrepresented minorities, which I think it's really interesting too, in a sense, in the sense that you're talking about fields that are so precise and for centuries, perhaps even millennia, have been defined by the acquisition of precise knowledge. Uh, if I go to the doctor, I, I, mean, I personally don't really care about the ethnicity of the doctor who treats me. I want to know that I have the best available medical care that either I can afford or that my health insurance can get me access to. Exactly. I really don't want to know that I got the pity admission guy <laughs> at Harvard Medical School who wasn't up to snuff and exactly. who barely cut it, but got hired by the hospital I'm at because his diploma says Harvard Medical School on it, for example. Yes. I mean, and the same applies to engineering, to uh uh, uh, to, to all kinds of fields that are, they're not defined by, I mean, I, I don't want a, I, I, it does not help me to know that the people who designed a bridge that goes across a 300 foot across uh, river <laughs> uh, had an equal proportionality of ethnic representation on the engineering bridge design team. I want to know that they are competent and got good grades in calculus and know how to make sure that the bridge will hold my car. <laughs> that, that's what exactly. and that, that's, uh, it, it seems to me there's something, um, uh, there's certainly, there's also something here about uh, where the American people as a whole to wax rhetorical for a moment, are sort of have an implicit trust in the university system. We still trust that graduates from the largest schools, which I also found fascinating as you're walking through that case history, you're not talking about tiny little fringe schools. Mm -hmm. You're talking about the University of California system is the largest state-run system of universities in the country. I believe the University of Texas system is second, if not third. Those are huge. University of Michigan is a has, has a huge voice in higher ed, but that we kind of tend to trust people from these institutions have a validity behind their degree that attests yeah. to the quality of their education. But from what you're telling us, uh, we, we are really wrong to trust in that validity based on admissions. We, it's not the meritocracy that it pretends to be. That is, yes, that is true. Um, an additional wrinkle that might make you feel better about Okay. bridges, <laughs> but is unfortunate for the people involved, is the problem of mismatch, which Commissioner Harriet has written about a lot. Um, Rick Sander, who is a law professor at UCLA, and Stuart Taylor, who is a journalist, have written a lot about this. And what it is, is when you are admitted to a university or to a class for which you are unprepared relative to the rest of the class. You wind up, so let's assume you are, let's assume using the good old 1600 point SAT scale, you know, and 
800 for math, you know, let's say that you have a 660 in math, which is perfectly respectable. You know, um, you can go be a STEM student at many fine institutions and you will be right in the middle of the pack with other people who have similar math SAT scores. So there's that option. But if you are an underrepresented minority, you might get admitted with your 660 SAT score to somewhere like Duke or MIT or Caltech, where everybody else has 750s, 780s, 800s. And it's not that you are dumb, that you are a bad student. None of that is true. It's that everybody, almost everybody else in your class is more advanced than you are. And because the professor will be pitching the material he's teaching to the middle of the class, mm -hmm. he's going to be pitching and teaching his material for the people who have the 750s. And you with your 660 are going to be working really hard to catch up. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times you don't catch up. And so you see a lot of attrition among particularly black students from STEM majors. Um, and they're actually, they, they are thinking for a while was well, maybe black students aren't really interested in STEM, but they're actually slightly more likely to express interest in a STEM major when they enter college than our white students. But because they're admitted to schools where they're not a great fit, it, they wind up washing out because, you know, they can't keep up and you get very discouraged and you think I'm going to flunk. And so you wind up switching to an easier major. And so as a result, um, you wind up with fewer Black doctors, engineers, all that sort of thing than you would have if they had gone, if instead of going to MIT, they had gone to Vanderbilt, they probably would have graduated with that engineering degree or you know that other degree. And, but they didn't because they were admitted to a school that was beyond their credentials. So they wound up getting some other less rigorous degree. And correct me if I'm wrong, but doesn't the, let's say if in your example, if it's MIT versus Vanderbilt, MIT has, does MIT have any kind of financial incentive to admit folks in that position? Um, I mean, they would have, all the universities have, I wouldn't so much say a financial incentive, but they have an incentive to not have their numbers be too white or too Asian. So they have an incentive both from a public relations perspective, from a keeping current students happy perspective, from um, an accreditation perspective to admit these people. Because if you're admitted to one of these schools, most of the time you're going to graduate eventually. Um, eventually. But eventually, <laughs> like it might take you five years instead of four. It might only take you four. It, it, it's not really a financial incentive thing. It's, yeah. it's deeper than that. Okay. I just think it's really interesting. Like, like, I don't really know what to do with the stat, but I keep running into people who will quote the stat that uh, something like uh, we're down to about 60% of those admitted to colleges graduate within four years. Mm -hmm. And there's, it's between 20 and the number of people who drop out of college is somewhere between that 20 and 40% of the remainder. So I wonder if this is this is part of that story. That that information seems to me to fit together. If you have people who are admitted to universities that uh, really are are beyond where they will succeed at, and uh, that really then that's that's a that's a I, I like that term for you said mismatch earlier. That's a mismatch in in the admissions department. That yes. part of what I would assume and admit a good admissions team is looking to do is to create the conditions of, for success for an incoming class where they want to bring in people who will contribute to the institution, who will benefit from it, and who will also graduate on time. Yeah. But, but mismatching that, it, it literally sets students up for failure. 
It really does. And um, I think that a lot of um, what I'm talking about probably does not play too much into um, what you're talking about, just because if you're smart enough to get admitted to Harvard or Vanderbilt, even with a preference, like you're going to be able to graduate with something and it might take you five years, but it also takes people five years because they can't decide what they want to major in and they keep changing. So I think, I think I could be wrong, but I think a lot of the dropout rate is driven more by people at community colleges or at large state institutions where people aren't that necessarily committed to sticking with it. They're just going because it's what you do. And, you know, they, they decide it's not for them. Um, which I suppose if it's not, there's no point in throwing good money after bad. So. (laughs) Sure. Well, let me ask a different question then. um, So I think I, if we, uh, assuming everything you've said so far is correct, and there there's an existent problem here with the way some of the largest institutions in, in higher ed are handling admissions, where's the harm? I mean, I know obviously there there's if we if there there is some level of harm to these students themselves, but there's also the possibility that they work really hard and uh, unexpected to succeed guy makes it through MIT and now has an MIT engineering degree. But where where is the harm? to others or the institution or where, where, where is the harm in this problem? There is, there's harm, uh, to a number of, a a number of places. Um, one thing also that Commissioner Harriet and I discuss in her essay, uh, I'm not sure if it's, if it's this one or if the one she wrote by herself, but there is at least an argument that it's better to graduate from a slightly lower ranked school with better grades then from the best school you can get into and barely graduate that you will have like earn more have more career success if you're at the top of say penn state rather than toward the bottom of princeton so Mm -hmm. that is that's another argument um you know even if you manage to squeak through and again some people will go they will completely succeed it will be great but one of the things that um, I think people have to remember in life is generally um, when you see statistics and that sort of thing, you have to assume you will be in the majority, not that you're going to be the outlier because you know usually you are. So that's one thing. Obviously, there's also a harm to the students who do not receive these places. And um, you can certainly see that among Asian American students who increasingly feel that they are, because they are discriminated against, even relative to white students. Uh, And you can see uh, students for fair admissions has sued Harvard. And so that is an additional problem. Um, And I I don't think that it contributes to, I think it not only does not contribute, but it detracts from racial harmony when some groups feel like they are discriminated against on behalf of other groups and can lead to does not is not conducive to not having feelings of bitterness um so i think on a broader scale that's bad it's also bad for the universities because it's a corruption they are lying about why they do this um, or at least misleading people um, as we were discussing they say it's about diversity but only certain types of diversity are what they're looking for and um, you know it also um, winds up corrupting the fields when they are not looking for the person who is the best fit but like you were talking about earlier they're talking about the per- they're looking for the person who writes the best diversity statement so it also undermines the pursuit of excellence in all fields not just stem but every field so i think that the harm really extends in all directions well, i think it, and uh this is taking it up a notch from the undergraduate discussion, but certainly in the uh, at the at the graduate school level, uh, as I have several friends who finished their PhDs, and it's a it's a bleak job market unless yeah. you're going into a PhD field with some diversity cards. And if you have no diversity cards in the PhD job market, you're basically just a resume on the pile of resumes. And 
uh, it's 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 rough. So I mean, I, I think that would only spread that same problem out further as as this continues. Now, a couple of times in our conversation, you mentioned accreditation agencies. I know I was fascinated by the section in your essay about the role accreditation agencies play in this. Could you walk us through some of the uh, some of the schools that have had to fight accreditation agencies on this yes. question? Let me pull this up here because it is rather lengthy, but. Um... And it was just a, I re, it was a who's who list of schools. Like I recognized several of the names that were in that section of the chapter. And yes. I was just shocked that I, mean, I was not expecting Stanford to get dinged for not being willing to have a diversity statement or some, of some sort. I mean, that just, that surprised me. Yes. Well, a lot of schools at first will object and then the pressure gets to them because so uh, as you mentioned, uh, as we, we say in here, the first case was Baruch College, which is one of the colleges of the City University of New York. But uh, in 1990, they were threatened with the loss of accreditation because they were, it, um, the accreditor said that they did not hire a sufficient number of minority faculty members and it didn't retain a sufficient number of Black and Latino students. Um, so they were, their accreditation was deferred, but eventually this was reported in the New York Times. Um, and then eventually Secretary of Education, Lamar Alexander deferred the Middle States Association of Colleges and Schools, deferred its status as an accrediting agency. And then Middle States wound up backing off Baruch College. Uh, then in, 1988, the Western Association of Schools and Colleges had adopted diversity standards for colleges and universities. Um, and then they, um, sorry, this is such a lengthy section, um, but uh, the schools that were part of it had to more clearly delineate their goals with respect to increasing representation of minorities and women and inclusion of the study and analysis of issues related to diversity and its curriculum and progress made in reaching those goals, which sounds very much like the diversity statement you came across when you were looking at that PhD. So uh, Thomas Aquinas College in California objected to this. And by 1994, 14 schools, including Caltech, Stanford and USC were objecting to WASC's decision to promulgate an official diversity statement. Um, and the problem was, um, and at the time there were faculty members who were opposed to such diversity statements because they saw the road, I, I believe, they saw the road it was going to go down from, of course we are open to hiring everyone to preferences. Um, but uh, the policy was reaffirmed and, uh, but, you know, uh, by the late 1990s, uh, a lot of law schools and medical schools felt that they needed to do something about diversity and to take race into consideration when making admissions decisions. So um, it is something that the schools have to take seriously. And our book goes into great detail about what happened to George Mason University School of Law. And George Mason was just in a very difficult position. They are in an area where there are a lot of law schools. They are a very good regional law school, but they don't have the national profile of say Georgetown or George Washington. And so, with racial preferences, the other thing you have to realize is when schools are using racial preferences, the schools at the top of the academic heap are going to hoover up most of the, the really qualified minority students. And mm -hmm. of course, you know, if you are a really qualified minority student, you're going to want to go to the best school that you can get into, like anybody else. Um, so George and um, so if you wanted to be in this area, in the DC area, and you wanted to go to law school here, uh, and you were a minority student, you were probably going to go to Georgetown or George Washington rather than George Mason. 
So George Mason got in trouble with its accreditors, was having trouble getting reaccredited. They were trying everything to try to recruit more minority students. It was a years long saga. And again, um, the, the faculty were very reluctant to lower standards too much to get more Black and Hispanic students because it doesn't serve those students to be admitted to a school that where they can't compete, that they may wind up dropping out of, or that they will only graduate fr from after a lot of struggles. So that is an additional consideration for all colleges, universities, and professional schools. I think there's so much there that uh, just it it strikes me as really intriguing that there it seems that this vision of diversity as kind of a, a soft racial profiling in a way mm -hmm. uh, really is it's it's a sort of infantilizing. I mean, it's it, there's a sort of a, there's an insult implied here as well that of course you couldn't make it for our real standards, so we have these special standards for the people who help us achieve public relations goals and and other things that itself is a kind of uh, I almost want to there, there's there's some link in my head here between this and like a sort of a soft despotism of low standards yes that, and it, it stands in such marked contrast of um, uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s I have a dream speech outlines this beautiful vision of racial harmony but it's a racial harmony that's grounded in a uh, a, a, a shared human nature and a shared universal uh, recognition that we can all live under a common law and we can each have jobs under certain standards, but to do, and that creates real equality, but everything you're describing is a harm to that kind of real equality. And instead we get a, a very different picture, a picture of institutions sacrificing their own integrity of, of really failing to help the very people they exist to serve and of uh, doing so in the name of diversity and yet failing to create the place where you can have a true diversity grounded in in actual human nature and human equality is... absolutely and i think you know something that's that is kind of overlooked is that colleges and universities by doing this are also depriving black and hispanic students of a particular benefit which is and this may not sound like a benefit, but I truly believe it is, which is the benefit of finding your level. Mm -hmm. If this may not make this may not sound right, but um, if you well, there's first of all the satisfaction of knowing that I got into this college and university through my own hard work and on my own merits, not because I was given a leg up or a preference or I mean, some college, many colleges and universities do give a leg up for athletes or musicians or someone with great artistic talent, which I think is fine. That is still like something you have worked at, some sort of something you are bringing to the table. This is still something that um, is a unique talent, not just an accident of birth. Um, but I, I do think that there is a benefit to that white and Asian students get from actually from being denied, if this makes sense, not, not, not discriminated against, but if you work as hard as you can and you throw your heart into something and you do well, but you're not getting a 1600, like it's still good to know where you are for real. You know, um, and I think that 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 is useful information for you going forward and is also good to kind of get that out of the way early in life to be like, okay, this is me, <laughs> you know, and, sure. and it's harder when it comes later in life, I think. No, I think there's there's a lot of truth to that. It, it reminds me of two things. I remember a moment when I, I looked around at Hillsdale College and I went there planning to go into law and there were at the time there were about 1250 students at Hillsdale and I looked around and thought there's about 1200 other people here who are smarter than me who want to go into law. Law is not where I'm going to go. There, there's just, that, that's not me. Um, 
but I there that also reminds me of uh several years ago I read Frank Bruni's excellent little book he uh called Where You Go Is Not Who You Are. Mm-hmm. And he talks about the fact that uh, he wrote that book focusing primarily on a subset of New York private schools that are aimed at Ivy Leagues. Mm -hmm. And he got tracks a group of families that get into the right preschool to get to the right elementary school, to the right middle school, right high school, to get into Columbia and that that sort of trajectory. Yes. But he then goes out and he considers the fact that there are 4,400 schools for higher education in the United States. And only about 400 of them have big name national recognition. Mm -hmm. But there's this other 4,000 schools that he thinks people can get excellent educations at. He tracks a group of students who had the academic credentials to get into Yale or Columbia or Princeton or Harvard, but instead went to state schools. And he concludes that if you had the if you have the academic ability to get into one of that level of school, but choose to go somewhere else. Turns out those people come out doing just the same, if not better, than their counterparts who went Ivy League because mm-hmm. they become the people who will be successful wherever they go. And Bruni points me back to kind of something that is where uh, I think this is, is sort of hopeful because in the middle of all of this, we're talking about a certain echelon of schools that are using this as their admissions criteria. Um, there are plenty of schools that are not necessarily playing these particular games. And it may mean that people listening to this, if any of them are thinking about their college applications, it may mean that you shift where you're applying and what you're looking for, but that wherever people are going to college, there's still the possibility of making the best of the college that they get into. I think that is absolutely true. And in fact, um, in one of Commissioner Harriet's essays in here, she talks about HBCUs and HBCUs actually produce a disproportionate number of black science grads. And uh, and obviously there are not that many HBCUs in the country. Disproportionately higher or disproportionately lower? Disproportionately higher, uh, disproportionately greater. And um, one of the professors at an HBCU in there says, you know, as we see it, like these really high level schools are taking students who have great science potential, but, you know, and they have great credentials, but they aren't up to the level of these schools and they're wasting them Mm. because they can't keep up there. But they're, when they go to the HBCUs, that is the level that their credentials prepare them for. They do really well and they graduate and they go on to become doctors and dentists and things like that um, because they learned more. Because one of the things with mismatch is that when you are in this situation, it's not just that your credentials are lower, it's that you can't learn as much because the material's coming at you too fast and you're always trying to keep up. So you are a perfectly competent person. You just have the right, need to find the right place for you. And I agree with you completely. Um, I'm really interested in that Bruni book now. But this is something that I tell people a lot when they ask me about going to college or going to law school or whatever. Like, I think it is more a matter of finding the best fit for you. It's not about going to the biggest name necessarily. Um, It's not about all that sort of thing. Like the best fit for you, and I think the best fit for a lot of students actually is a smaller liberal arts college. Like, because it's not so overwhelming. You can really get to know your professors. You can build relationships with other people. Um, But you know, um, other people really like going to big state schools and that's great. Like you just have to know and really think about what is going to be a good fit for me and not get so hung up on the brand name. I think that's key. And uh, just lest uh, either of us come across as sounding accidentally racist on a podcast as we're talking about uh, race and college admissions, I I think you've described it really effectively. Uh, The question is not, uh, is this a white school or a black school or an Asian school or Hispanic school? The question is rather, it's really a position of self-knowledge. When you're looking at a school, I'm this sort of student. This is the level of work that I'm willing to put in academically. This is what makes me happy. This is what I love. Uh, is this school actually going to be a good fit? And that that is the question. And I think that's the question that, uh, well, I mean, 
I, I learned last year doing college, one year of college admissions that kids pick the schools they go to for the most astronomically stupid reasons on the planet. <laughs> I was one of those kids once upon a time. I, I picked my college because I, uh, I saw a guy in a, a, a patch sweater uh, smoking, a, smoking a pipe on the quad and it just looked so collegiate. I had to go to Hillsdale. <laughs> And, and so it's not that I, I don't expect any high schoolers list, or listening to this or thinking about it uh, or in the, in, the, in the terms we're describing this, um, but hopefully maybe we have the odd college professor or two that can see some of this on, on their campus. And hopefully also the odd parent. Um, oh, and That would be nice. <laughs> and, you know, there's another, um, an older study that Commissioner Harriet discusses in one of her essays that predates any of this discussion about affirmative action, all this sort of thing, it's from the late 50s, I believe, maybe early 60s, but it's called the college campus is frog pond. And <laughs> yes. Frog pond? <laughs> yes, frog pond. And the whole idea of the, I believe there were sociologists writing this was that, and at the time they were talking about college men mostly, like, do you go, like, if you're the marginal admit, so please bear in mind, they're talking at the time about mostly white college men. Um, so this, this has nothing to do with race. Um, do you go to the big frog pond where you're going to be like one tiny little, you know, frog and all these like superstar frogs are <laughs> going around there and you're just, you know, you're totally overlooked. Like you can't really develop your talents. Like you're just struggling to get along. Or do you go to the smaller frog pond where you're the average size of the other frogs? You might even be bigger than the other frogs and you can really blossom and develop your talents and all this sort of thing. And what these professors concluded was that for many people, it's better to go to the smaller frog pond um, where you can really um, grow rather than going to the most glamorous frog pond you can possibly get into. I would probably only add to that if we're, uh, since we've turned into a discussion of like college advice for hypothetical parents, <laughs> uh, I would add that uh, if we're comparing frog ponds, your smaller frog pond is more likely to have uh, actual convictions as an institution and to have professors who actually do want to profess things uh, on a convictional level and not to, not to suggest that the goal of college is some sort of indoctrination but there are certain convictions that professors bring out of the material they teach and that shape students in a certain way uh, that I think is much more able to happen in, in, the, in a smaller collegiate realm. Um, one essay I'll mention uh, is a, a little a nine page piece by Michael Oakeshott, a British philosopher from the 1950s. He wrote this beautiful little essay uh, called The Idea of the University. Uh, stealing the title shamelessly from John Henry Newman's big fat book of the same name. Uh, but Oakeshott's image of the university is sort of a, uh, it's a community of people come together. Uh, you've got the students, you've got the teachers, and then you've got the teachers who are also researchers. <laughs> and uh, for Oakeshott, he thinks all three, you have to have all three to really be a university. Because uh, it's those those people who are researching and teaching, they're the ones who draw the whole university upwards in the quest for knowledge. It's the actual teachers who are really good at translating and mediating, and it's the students that are being brought into this life of the mind. And it's a short three to four year window where whatever else you're going to do with the rest of your life, it's this time that you can actually pursue ideas that are worth knowing about with no concern for their practical utility. <laughs> And Oakshot thinks that after that, that's that's when family, career, bills, plumbing, all the concerns <laughs> of life uh, sort of pop up. And, and then you have to worry about those, have to deal with those. But for this short window of time, you get to join this, this rare community of people. Uh, and I, I at least think that happens much better in a, on a smaller scale in that smaller frog pond than in the much larger one. I agree completely. I think that's a, a beautiful idea. And I'd also say I went to a very small college, um, not at all glamorous, but one of the other benefits you get is professors who really do have the time to know the student because they might have 20 or 30 students in the class, maybe even fewer, as opposed to lecture halls filled with 100 or 200. So 
that's also something that I think is often overlooked when people are deciding where to go to college, like the ability to build those relationships and really develop a mentoring relationship is much easier at a smaller college. That's so true. And I mean, and certainly for students who are looking, if they've already got grad school in mind, I think it's um, the professors at small schools, uh, if they're presuming they're good professors, they've got those amazing connections at larger schools and mm -hmm. through their different associations and conferences and so on. And uh, I, I did not find any, I did not find problems getting into grad school coming out of Hillsdale as mm -hmm. no problem. My, my professors were able to help me get into Kansas State and Catholic University of America from this tiny little liberal arts college in Southern Michigan. I mean, that was, uh, it was not NC State. It wasn't UNC Chapel Hill. It wasn't UT Austin. It wasn't one of these big, huge names, but it was the fact that I had spent time on Dr. Stewart's yellow couch and had spent time in Dr. Gamble's living room and uh, had had at least heard about Dr. Siegel's uh, special uh, uh, dinners with with his favorite students. I was not one of his favorite students, so I didn't get invited to those dinners. <laughs> but those kinds of things then create the ability for professors to speak about students in a very real way. That yes, I think one of the saddest stories I've ever heard about uh, UNC Chapel Hill is from a friend of mine who did his PhD there. He taught a uh, he TA'd a class that was on uh, medical terminology. Uh, in the classics department. And uh, he had students who asked that he, if he would write their letter of recommendation to go on a grad programs. He was like, why? I was only your TA. And they're like, you're the only person close to being a professor who's learned my name in three years. That is very sad. I just, I cannot imagine that as my college experience. That would have been yeah. awful. Yes. Agreed. <laughs> well, Carissa, as we're wrapping up, let's uh, let's take this back around to our original uh, conversation. Uh, assuming we still have an audience, you'll remember we are talking about uh, this book today, uh, do A Dubious Expediency, How Race Preferences Damage Higher Education. We've been discussing the problem of a widespread appearance issue with big name colleges having racial preferences in their admissions practices, uh, big enough that we can point to Supreme Court cases from the 1970s from uh, up to 2003, 2013, and as recent ago as 2016. So this is an ongoing problem across not just particular small colleges, but some of the largest names in higher education. Well, Carissa, here on the Optimistic Curmudgeon, we're always looking for the hope. So I, as, we're, as we're wrapping up today, um, where, where do you see kind of solutions to this? What would it look like if, uh, if the same colleges we've been describing were to change these practices? What would what would a positive move towards a solution look like? Well, first of all, I think there's a lot of reason for hope. Um, two big reasons for hope. Um, a number of states have prohibited the use of racial preferences in higher education in their state schools. So Michigan has, um, after you know, University of Michigan wins the right to use race in admissions, and then the people of, Mich of Michigan by referendum say, nope, we're not doing it. And when the people uh, of Michigan actually get to vote, they speak loud and clear. And I yes. am waiting for when they vote Gretchen Whitmer out of office. Like, <laughs> it's going to be glorious. <laughs> and a number of other states over the past, oh, like mm, 25 to 30 years did the same, um, eliminating the use of race in admissions in state schools and also in state contracting, which is a big deal. And it's all across the country, Nebraska, Arizona, even Washington state and the big one, California. And so here is where the real optimism comes in. Um, back in 2019, the Washington state legislature decided to try to repeal their um, ban on racial preferences. And so because it was a state constitutional amendment, the legislature wound up like voting this out over fierce opposition from the Asian American community, which had pretty much not been vocal about this when it was a ballot measure before, um, but this woke them up. And because it was state constitutional amendment, it wound up going to the ballot and Washington state voters very narrowly voted to keep the state's prohibition on the use of race in colleges and um, and also in state contracting. Then in 2020, the California Assembly tried to do the same thing. Um, again, it had to go, it went to the ballot 
And um, actually, let me back that up. In Washington state, they had to gather enough signatures to force it to a referendum. And they managed to against all odds. These are tiny shoestring operations. And the same in California, they managed to get it on the ballot um, and totally, totally outfunded. Like every, Hollywood, Silicon Valley, everybody was on, on board with, we're getting rid of Prop 209. Um, I think it's Prop 209 that's the ban on that. So the new proposition is Prop 16. And California, deep blue California said, no, we are keeping the ban on racial preferences in admissions. So when it actually goes to voters, the voters say, and remember, California is a majority minority state. Mm -hmm. California did not want to go down that road. So that's one thing. Um, another reason for optimism, students for fair admissions is going, has applied for cert. Um, they might get it. Hopefully they'll get it. Um, we're very close to the 25 years Justice O'Connor talked about. Maybe the court will say, look, we gave you guys the chance. We're not going to continue down this path anymore. Um, but I, I think there's a lot of reasons for optimism. Love that. I, I love that picture of if you take this to the American people, um, we, we, we Americans are a fickle people sometimes, but there are a few things I think that we do. Uh, we're pretty agreed on. There's a there's a bedrock sense of fairness and justice at the heart of the American experiment and the idea that we should be a self-governing people who are all governed by the same law. We haven't always done that very well in our in our history, but we have consistently moved towards a more fair application of a common law. And I, I love those pic that picture of both California and Washington State. The elites may want to do one thing, and they want, may want to go back to a previous era of racial preferencing and racial profiling. But the American people, from wherever in the world they are, however many generations ago, uh, they, they want a meritocracy where each person stands on their own two feet and is, is able to access things based on their merits, not based on the uncontrollable accidents of birth. Yes. Oh, Carissa, thank you so much for joining me here today on The Optimistic Curmudgeon. Uh, where can people find and follow your work online? So I occasionally write for the Federalist Society's blog, um, and occasionally Commissioner Kersenow and I will write something together for National Review Online. So those are the two main places. I don't write publicly all that often, but occasionally I will write something in one of those two venues. Oh, fantastic. Well, I'll, uh, I'll find your, uh, your profiles on both of those sites and link those uh, in the show notes for this episode. Uh, and listeners, thank you for joining us for this episode of The Optimistic Curmudgeon. Be sure to check out our website at optimisticcurmudgeon.org, where you can, uh, you'll see Carissa's name linked. That'll take you to uh, the various places you can read more of her work. Until next time, love the good, pursue the beautiful. Uh, nope, we're gonna back that up. I'm gonna clip that last bit. Until next time, uh, seek the truth, love the good, and pursue the beautiful. You've been listening to another conversation on The Optimistic Curmudgeon. If you like what you've heard today, please leave us a five-star review on your favorite podcasting platform. If you want to get in touch with us, you can email us at optimisticcurmudgeon2021 at gmail.com. You can find us on all major social media sites. I'll list three. Uh, we're on Twitter at OptimisticC3, on Instagram at OptimisticCurmudgeon2021, and Facebook at Facebook.com slash the-optimistic-curmudgeon. You can find our show notes, guest bios, and all episodes stored on our website, OptimisticCurmudgeon.org. Until next time, seek the good, love the true, and pursue the beautiful. <laughs>